Hi everyone, welcome to the Santa Fe College Teaching Zoo. My name is Jade and I'm so excited to take you on a tour of our very special zoo. As it says in the name, we're a teaching zoo, which means all the zookeepers we're going to meet are getting their associates in science and zoo animal technology. Now we're also the only teaching zoo on a college campus that's accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, which means all of our students are getting the highest standard of training in animal welfare, conservation, and education. Today we're going to meet some incredible animals that you could encounter right here in Florida and animals from all over the world. We'll meet our zookeepers and see how they care for over 200 animals that call our zoo home. Now, due to the current health crisis, things look a little different as we prepare to welcome our guests back to our zoo. All of our staff will be wearing masks to make sure that everyone, including our animals, are safe. So before we go in, let's mask up and let's head on in. Everyone meet our welcoming committee, our white-throated capuchin monkey troop. Oh, actually, Wait, they're not quite out yet. You see, capuchin monkeys are highly intelligent, wild animals, and it is not safe for our keepers to work in the same space as them. So every day they ask our capuchin monkeys to go into a separate area where they can close a door between them. This is called protected contact. There's always a barrier between them so that they can safely care for them in the way they need to. And it looks like we're just in time for them to come out so we can see what the keepers have in store for them today. All right, let's go talk to our keepers, Kelly and Laura, and find out what the capuchins have in store for them today. Hey guys, how you doing? Good, how about you? Good. Uh, Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about what's on the menu for breakfast today? So today the capuchins got hard boiled egg, they got spinach, snap peas, and squash, and monkey biscuits as well. We put their diet scattered throughout the enclosure to allow them to forage for it, to mimic those natural behaviors that they have in the wild, since they spend a lot of their day looking for food and foraging. Awesome, very cool. And Laura, I see some extra things in there. Why did you guys put those everywhere? So what you're seeing in the enclosure is enrichment. Um, we put enrichment every day so that they can stay physically active and mentally stimulated. Today we have some cardboard boxes and paper tubes hung with some vines. We've placed some of their diet items in the boxes and in the tubes so that they can forage and think a little bit about how to get their food. Very nice. Well, it sounds like they have a lot to do today. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Let's go ahead to our commissary and see where this delicious breakfast was made. Good morning, commissary. Good morning. Welcome to our zoo's kitchen. It probably looks a little bit different than yours at home, but that's because our zookeepers are making diets for more than 200 animals. This is actually one of the first sections our zookeepers work when they start here. Oh, hey, Jen. Hi. Oh, what do we got on the menu today? So this morning, our lemurs are getting monkey chow biscuits soaked in grape juice, snow peas, blueberries, strawberries, and apples. Yum. Our job as keepers is to make sure that all of our animals are getting a nutritionally balanced diet. Perfect. Well, I wish my lunch looked that good today. <laughs> well, we're going to let our chefs get back to business. Thank you guys so much, and let's head over to our herp house. Bye! This is our herp house, where many of our reptiles and amphibians live, and where our students learn how to give the specialized care these types of animals need. They also get the opportunity to create a habitat from scratch. They research an animal and find out where it lives and how it lives in it, and then they completely deep clean an enclosure and put brand new ground cover, limbs, and decoration. Not only do the zookeepers learn a new skill, but our animals often get new environmental enrichment. Check out this habitat our keepers made for our native common king snake. The king snake is named for its ability to eat venomous snakes. The zookeepers created a new habitat similar to where the snake may be found in Florida. Watch how it explores its new home. Let's go take a closer look and see some of our other reptiles and amphibians in their habitats around our herp house. We 
have a lot of Florida native snakes here in our herp house, including venomous snakes. That's right. Our students learn from the instruction of our staff how to care for venomous snakes. So with tools like the snake hook or these pillstroms, we can safely feed and care for them for snakes like southern copperheads and these beautiful eastern diamondback rattlesnakes behind me. And I also heard today that they're giving a rodent to our dusky pygmy rattlesnakes. So let's go see that training in action. Not only do the students learn to work with venomous snakes, but we even have venomous lizards. Meet our Gila monsters. These are new additions to the zoo, and boy, do they love to dig. Gila monsters are the largest lizard native to the United States. Speaking of large native reptiles, look at this beautiful eastern indigo snake. These non-venomous snakes average five to seven feet in length. Like all snakes, eastern indigos play an important role in their habitat as pest control and within the food chain. Sadly, the habitat they are vital to is disappearing. So partners within the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, or AZA, government agencies and conservation organizations are breeding indigos with the hope of reintroducing them into protected areas in Southern Alabama and Northwest Florida. We're extremely honored to be part of this effort. Meet the gopher tortoise, the only tortoises native to Florida and are most known for their burrows. Without the gopher tortoise, hundreds of animals, including the indigo snake, gopher frogs, and burrowing owls that rely on their burrows for refuge could be threatened. The gopher tortoises you'll see at our zoo all experienced injuries in the wild, like Celeste here. In 2016, Celeste was brought to the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine due to a missing limb, likely from a dog. The vets performed a full amputation and he was brought here to receive care from our zookeepers. Although Celeste cannot be released into the wild due to his injury, he's living his best life here, getting top-notch care from our keepers and regular visits from our vets. All right, now before we leave the herp house, I wanted to introduce you to one of my favorite animals here. And lucky enough, one of our keepers, Keely, has her out socializing her right now. Hey, Keely. How are you, Dave? Good. So most people, when they see this animal, might think snake. But uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this intriguing creature? Absolutely. So this is Ophi, our Sheltapusic. And yeah, you might think she's a snake, but if you actually look at both sides of her head, you'll see small openings, which are ear holes, which snakes do not have. And she also has eyelids, much like we do. And if you look along the side of her body here, close to her belly, you'll see that she actually has a lateral fold. Now these guys have really compact scales and are not very flexible like snakes. So this fold actually helps them to be able to swallow their food and breathe. Very cool. Now she's pretty amazing looking. Do we have any lizards like this here in Florida? Oh, absolutely. If you're really lucky and you're walking along a trail, you might actually be able to see the Eastern glass lizard, which is a relative of the Sheltapusic. Awesome. Well, Ophi, I hope you have an awesome little outing. Thank you, Keely. Absolutely. We're now entering our Florida wetland and we get so many native visitors here. We see little blue herons and wood storks, bullfrogs and banded water snakes. This is the perfect place to quietly reflect. And if you're lucky, you just might hear some calls of bullfrogs, cicadas, birds in the trees, or see some snakes basking on the logs. You'll probably see a lot of turtles catching some rays on the logs too. And that's because many of them live here permanently because they have injuries they sustained in the wild. The turtles are our only full-time residents in our Florida wetland. And it actually looks like our zookeepers are here to feed our American alligators, Brutus and Rainbow, who have lived at our zoo for almost 30 years. Let's go check it out. Hi, Emily, how are you today? I'm doing good, how are you doing? Good, so this is Brutus. What do we feed a 430 pound alligator? So today we're gonna be feeding them this grain diet. And this is actually made of all the things that they'd be eating in the wild. So we've got some blood in here, some animal products, mm. and all of this <laughs> together creates a nutritionally balanced diet for these guys that we can feed them. Awesome, and I noticed you throwing them in. Why do, why do you guys throw them in like that? So we actually have a technique for feeding them. Instead of just tossing it in, we actually try to throw it, arc it as high as we can. And the reason we do that is because alligators have these sensory pits on their mouth. And if you look it up, you can actually see them. And in the wild, if something moves in the water, since they're eating in the water primarily, 
Um, they can sense the vibrations from the water when it hits their mouth and they'll be able to tell where their diet is and how about how far away it is so they can go catch it. Very cool. Well, let's see this in action. Most people underestimate the intelligence of these ancient reptiles. Just as we train our capuchin monkeys to move to a separate space so we can clean, we also train these guys. Through a special sound called a cue, the alligators will walk into a holding area so the keepers can safely clean. And what is their reward for their effort? Whole chicks and rats. Maybe not the treat we would choose, but these special food items are very motivating for this carnivorous couple. Much like the alligators, our next native reptiles are masters of camouflage. But instead of blending in to sneak up on their lunch, they blend in to avoid becoming it. Let's take a closer look and see if we can find a Florida box turtle. With their brown and yellow patterned shells, Florida box turtles blend in perfectly with their surroundings. Oh look, there's one now. Every day the zookeepers spend a lot of time searching for each turtle to make sure they are in tip-top shape. Because of their super camouflage, this can be quite the task. Finding all of the animals and ensuring they're safe and healthy is definitely a challenge for our zookeepers every day. But in this program, they learn very quickly how to be flexible, creative, and patient. And there's no better place to learn those skills than our Florida aviary. It has multiple species of birds in it, all native to Florida. And it's really tricky to figure out how to make sure every animal gets what they need. So how do we do that? Let's ask two of our zookeepers that take care of them all the time. Hey guys, how you doing? Yeah. So, um, Kalia, can you tell us what kind of diet do these guys get? Yeah, definitely Jade. So we have seven species of birds in there and they all eat about the same thing with a little bit of variation to them. Everyone in there eats a dry pelleted diet. It's kind of similar to what your dogs or cats might eat at home, a tiny little kibble consistency. On top of that, they love their insects and they eat mealworms, sometimes crickets. And then lastly, they also get fish. Everybody in there gets some silver sides, capelin and herring, although the spoonbills will tell you that the herring's not their favorite, the fish feeding is their favorite part. <laughs> nice, so they're a little picky. <laughs> well, Shelly, can you tell us that's a lot of birds and a lot of food. How do we make sure every bird gets what they need? Well, because we have so many animals in the enclosure, we actually need to do this thing called stationing, where the animals will actually go to their areas where we throw the food and receive their food, such as their fish or their mealworms. And right now we actually do have breeding season, so it, this limits aggression between all of the animals in the enclosure. Awesome, good to hear. Well, that sounds like quite a challenge every day for sure. <laughs> now the next animals we're going to meet really love fish too, but uh, just prepare yourself because we're about to have cuteness overload. What did I tell you? This is our Asian small clawed otter family. Last year, Chicha and Duncan traveled to the SF Teaching Zoo from other zoos accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums as part of a species survival plan. SSPs are programs managed by experts within the zoo field that aim to protect threatened species. Their goals are to ensure healthy populations in zoos, spread awareness, and support field conservation programs. Chitra and Duncan didn't waste much time starting their family after they arrived. They now have seven pups. To ensure the pup's health, our job is to perform health checks and weigh them to make sure everyone is reaching their milestones. But Duncan and Chitra are most essential to their care, and these first-time parents are doing an amazing job. Just look at how they carry the youngest pups and teach them how to swim. Right next door to the otter family are brothers Mac and Bryson, the Visayan warty pigs. During breeding season, these guys grow impressive mohawks. As you can see, they're just now starting to get their classic rock star hairdos, but trust me, in just a few short weeks, they'll be sporting full hairband locks. Like their wild counterparts, Mac and Bryson like to root around in the ground for their food, which mainly consists of forest fruits and tubers. This gives the zookeepers a lot of opportunities to hide their food in novel ways so the pigs can use their highly sensitive noses to push dirt or even whole logs around. I'm so excited to introduce you to the next animals. Any guesses on what kind of animal that is? Red panda, bear, sloth, maybe an opossum? Actually, this is Adelaide and Eki, the Machis tree kangaroos. That's right. In Papua New Guinea, these kangaroos have adapted to live high up in the trees. Their long tails help them balance and their sharp nails help them hold on to branches and tree trunks. As you can see, those claws are especially helpful in grabbing tasty snacks. 
Many of the plants that grow at our zoo are harvested and fed to the animals like our tree kangaroos, who eat a lot of leaves and twigs in the wild. We are proud supporters of the Tree Kangaroo Conservation Program that works to protect endangered tree kangaroos in Papua New Guinea and the people who live among them. When you visit the zoo, your admission helps us support animals like these. If you look long enough at our African grassland, you might start to notice some moving rocks. Your eyes aren't betraying you. You're actually seeing our resident leopard tortoises, Palpatine, Darth, and Luke. Leopard tortoises are the fourth largest species of tortoise in the world. Now maybe they don't reach Death Star proportions, but they can weigh well over 50 pounds, with some individuals reaching even double that size. Routinely, the zookeepers weigh the tortoises to ensure they are growing at a healthy rate. Come on, it looks like Darth is stepping up on the scale. Hey Mo, let's see what Darth is weighing these days. 32.8 kilograms. Oh my gosh, that is over 72 pounds. All right, let's see what little Luke is weighing now. Four kilograms, that's not even nine pounds. Wow, what a difference a couple decades can make. We really love turtles and tortoises around here, so it's probably no surprise that our next habitat is home to another species of tortoise. Oh, hi, Michaela. What are you up to over here? Hi, Jade. I'm using an ethogram today. It's a tool that us researchers and zookeepers use to see what our animals are up to throughout the day. Very cool. Well, in this large habitat, there's a lot to observe. You might see the Asian brown tortoises grazing on some delicious grass or the East African gray crown cranes performing courtship dance rituals. If you're lucky, you might even see the Reeves muntjac resting near a fallen tree. So Michaela, who are you observing today and what have you seen from them? Today I'm watching our East African crowned cranes and today they've been doing mostly foraging and looking for food. However, I have seen them walking around very close together and some hints of courtship display. Wow, that's really cool. Well, let's take a moment and let's see what we observe. <music> going to meet are often heard before they're seen. Our red rough lemur family are experts in relaxing. We often see them napping or resting in their favorite sun worshiping yoga pose. They might pause to use their specialized tooth comb to groom their fluffy red fur, but then suddenly <laughs> there's a ruckus. Why in the world are they making these noises? Scientists believe it is a way for them to warn members of the troop if a predator is overhead or to communicate to each other from a distance when they spread out to find food. Here at the zoo, though, the culprit's usually a falling leaf or maybe a hawk flying from above. Let's travel from the rainforest of Madagascar to the forests of Cuba. Meet Ricky and Lucy, our resident Cuban Amazons. Since these two are a bonded pair, we often see them cuddled next to each other or alloprening. Alloprening is a fancy term for cleaning or preening each other's feathers. Our students take a class called aviculture where they learn all about behaviors like this so they can better understand the animals in their care. Our students also take a mammal culture class so that they can learn the best possible care for our animals like our primates, our hoofstock, and our cats. A lot of people ask us, why don't we have tigers and lions? Well, remember, our students are learning to become zookeepers. So we can teach them all about working with lions safely without all the unnecessary risk. And the best animals for them to learn that from are Zeus and Emma right behind me. Like we've seen with our other more dangerous animals, the zookeepers close doors between them and the cats so they can safely prepare their exhibit. When they're done, they exit and open the door so the cats can explore and do what they do best, find a cozy place to take a nap. We have many animals at our zoo that are of geriatric age. Emma, for instance, our ocelot, is over 23 years old. Ocelots in the wild usually live around 10 years old. Because we have resources such as our veterinarians and dedicated zookeepers who support them, animals in zoos are often living much longer lives than in the wild. Let's see some of the supportive care firsthand. Hey, Mary, how's it going? Hey, how are you? Good. Can you tell me a little bit about what you were offering Leo there? Sure. Um, so Leo is one of our um, older squirrel monkeys. He's about 24 years old now. And in addition to his uh, complete diet, we offer him the supplement of Ensure, 
Um, as we age, it's kind of similar for squirrel monkeys. Um, we start to lose muscle mass and bone density. So we offer supplements like Ensure to, as a direct source of those essential vitamins and minerals um, to keep his muscle mass at a healthy level and his, keep his bones strong so he can have a really healthy long life. Awesome. It seems like he really looks forward to coming down for well, that too. I think, well, it's liquid candy for him. So. <laughs> awesome. It's also my favorite part of the day. Uh, well, thank you for taking such yeah, good of care of him. So far, we've seen animals from all over the world on our tour here at our zoo. But we're really lucky to live in a place that has some pretty spectacular species right in our own backyards, like our friend, the barred owl. Within the wilds of Florida, barred owls are skilled hunters who silently fly through the forest. But they can still succumb to dangers of living near humans. Charlie here had a run-in with this truck, resulting in a broken wing. Thanks to our partners at UF, vets performed surgery to repair the injury. It was determined that he could not fly well enough to survive in the wild, so we were able to give him a forever home. Now he lives with Pascal, another barred owl, with similar injuries who needed refuge. The zookeepers work tirelessly every day to ensure that Pascal and Charlie are living their best lives here at our zoo. The next habitat is home to our family of white-handed gibbons. Like our other primates, the zookeepers ask the gibbons to go to a back area so they can safely clean. And cleaning this habitat is no easy feat. After the keepers hike through the lush bamboo, they ascend up ladders to tidy up the gibbon shelters. But it's all worth it when Eddie, Gibson, Holmes, Cajun, with her newborn in tote, come bounding out to appreciate their newly cleaned home. And to make sure we're all very aware that this is their family's home, they join together for their daily song. <laughs> Truly incredible. Why don't we just hang out a moment and marvel at these amazing apes? So far, we've seen many examples of how our keepers use their ingenuity and creativity to encourage natural behaviors, but what do you do for a skillful hunter who can leap 10 feet in the air? Let's go find out. Caracals are carnivores, or meat eaters, and use speed and agility to catch their prey. In Africa and Southwest Asia, they will chase down small mammals and use their sharp claws to grab them, but they really shine when they leap in the air to swap birds in flight. To bring out these hunting instincts, keepers will hide ground meat high up on limbs or hang whole prey items to entice them to jump. Hi, Clark. <laughs> Clark here is a red-billed hornbill, another animal native to Africa. And these birds have some pretty interesting nesting habits. A pair will make a nest in a tree cavity. The females will lay three to six eggs and she'll seal herself in by combining fruit pulp mud and droppings and essentially cementing the cavity opening. She'll stay in there while she sits on the eggs and even after the chicks are hatched. The male will then spend his day collecting food. Using his specialized curved beak, he'll deliver her food through a small opening in their cement concoction. Can't beat breakfast in bed every day. Let's go meet another feathered friend who also has a very special beak. Ernest the yellow crown Amazon hatched right here at our zoo in 2009. You can see she has a curved bill too, but it's much shorter than Clark's. Instead of using a long curved bill to forage in holes, parrots have a strong hook bill that is perfect for opening up seeds and cracking nuts. She also has very special feet. Her feet have a zygodactyl arrangement, so her toes look like an X, and they're perfect for walking on branches and holding her food. Watch how effortlessly she can crack open a nut. Bird nests come in a variety of shapes and sizes, and one of the grandest belongs to our national bird, the bald eagle. Bald eagle pairs build five to six feet wide nests high up in the trees. In early 2020, a storm passed through Three River State Park, dislodging an eagle pair's nest to the ground. Thanks to the dedication of park service officials, rehabbers, and veterinarians, the little eaglet found in the nest survived. Since her wing injury did affect her ability to fly, 
River will be living her best life here at our zoo. We are so lucky to have the opportunity to see River grow and watch her get her adult plumage, and she'll help us teach all our guests about these incredible birds. We've gotten to see our keepers utilize training to work safely with our animals. But not only does training keep them safe, it also allows the animals to participate in their own health care. While most of the time our keepers are keeping a distance from our animals, with our next feather friend, they get up close and personal. Hi, Ingrid, can you tell us a little bit about the special training you do every day with our emu? Of course. This morning we will be doing desensitization that is also known as desense. This is the type of training we do with a syringe to make the emu get used to the sensation of a vaccination or a blood draw, for example. We use duck chow that, believe it or not, is his favorite food, so when he's calm, we reward him with it. Awesome, well let's see it in action. If you're like me, you love to wake up to the sounds of birds chirping in the morning. If you live in Australia, you might get a wake up call like this. You can probably see why these laughing kookaburras are nicknamed the Bushman's Clock. One of the many perks of being a zookeeper is having a live soundtrack of animals from around the world while you work every day. Next, we're gonna go off the beaten path to see a very rare animal you probably wouldn't see when you visit. Let's go. This is Ripley the Guam Rail, and he has a very important job here at our zoo. He's an ambassador for his wild cousins. This little brown bird was once found in Guam and is called Coco on the island. Prior to the 1950s, Coco birds had no major predators, so they were able to live safely on the forest floor as a flightless bird, laying their eggs and nests just scraped into the ground. Cargo ships after World War II were likely the cause of introducing an invasive predator called the brown tree snake that birds on the island were not adapted to defend themselves from. Many species of birds became imperiled, so the local government and conservation organizations like zoos, accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, swooped in to save the cocoa bird. Through breeding programs in Guam and at zoos like ours, these birds are coming back from the brink. Once considered extinct in the wild, they are now designated critically endangered with established populations on nearby islands of Rhoda and Cocos. Zookeepers not only make a difference for the lives of the animals in their care, but they're also working to protect species in the wild. Chicks hatched right here at our zoo, cared for by our keepers, have gone off to be part of the breeding program and released on the island of Rhoda. In our aviary, we have two very special, beautiful green birds found on different continents. In the forests of Africa lives the Guinea Turaco, and nesting in the trees of South America, the hawk-headed parrots. Tropical forests are notably warm and humid, which makes Florida climate comfortable for both of these birds, most of the time. Here in Gainesville, we actually get some cooler weather, or at least cool by a Floridian standards. For our residents that are less adapted to cold weather, the zookeepers offer heat sources and protection from chilly winds. We've met so many knowledgeable keepers today, it can be hard to remember that they're still keepers in training. Our students learn to work with a variety of animals so that they can learn to adapt to the needs of different species. But like we talked about with our cats and primates, safety is key. And our next animal is pretty good at challenging our keepers and teaching them how to work with larger animals. Meet Squirt the Guanaco. Guanacos are wild ancestors of the llama and are found in South America. To safely work around Squirt, one keeper cleans and feeds while the other keeps a watchful eye on him. You might be able to guess how Squirt got his name. Guanacos are skilled spitters. Many a keeper have experienced a spray of carrot confetti from even six feet away. We'll go ahead and leave the grasslands of Peru to observe some chatty parrots from the forests of Brazil. Golden conures, like most parrots, are savvy communicators. It's not just the screeching and the squawking that's doing all the talking. Their bright yellow colors, the way they puff up or slick back their feathers, their eyes and how they position their body are all ways they are constantly communicating to other conures in their flock. As a zookeeper, understanding each animal's behaviors and what they are trying to communicate is vital to the job. 
You might remember Ernest, the yellow crown Amazon. Well, her sister lives right next door to these guys and she gets an earful all day thanks to her noisy neighbors. She might even be able to get a word in from time to time. Well, our tour wouldn't be complete unless we came upon one of our free ranging peafowl. And um, looking by this guy, I can see right away that he's one of our male peacocks. And that's because he's got those really beautiful blue feathers on his head and his neck. And as you can see, he's starting to grow that really majestic train. And all of this is designed to impress the ladies. Thank you so much for joining us on this adventure through our zoo and learning about the incredibly rewarding job of a zookeeper. Not only are they helping the animal ambassadors live their best lives here at the teaching zoo, they're inspiring others through education and making a difference for wild animals and places. You can learn more about how we're improving the future for wildlife by checking out our conservation initiatives on our website and following us on Facebook as we continue bringing the zoo to you. We hope to see you soon. Stay safe and healthy.